Good morning. Good morning. All right, let's all stand together. We're so glad you've joined us this morning. We're going to start off by reading our memory verse for the month out of Joshua chapter 21, verse 45. Let's say this together. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord had made to the house of Israel had failed. All came to pass. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. You are good and faithful and true. Every promise you have made is going to be completed. Father, we praise you that you are here in this place. And Lord, I ask you to please move in our hearts and our minds. Draw us to give our full, wholehearted attention to you. Lord, as we sing these words and these next few songs, Lord, I pray you help us truly. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm excited that you guys are here. I'm excited that I'm here. 
And I'm excited for everybody joining us at home. So thank you for tuning in on Facebook and YouTube. We love you. We are so glad that you're a part of our family this morning. Um, if you will, just click that like and share button. Uh, that way you can kind of help us share the gospel with more people. Um, also, we put a number up on the screen, and this is for everybody in the sanctuary too as well every week. If you have a need or you want to figure out a way to get more involved or get plugged in, text that number. And that will send you a link to a Connect card, and you can fill that out, and somebody from the staff will get in contact with you in 24 to 48 hours. Um, and then we can try to figure out how we can get you in to this family. Because that's what it is. It's a family. And I don't know where you're at this morning. I don't know what you walked in with. But maybe it's stress. Maybe it's hate. Maybe it's anger. Maybe it's worry. And right now, that is heavy on your heart. But if you'll just allow me, I want to speak life over you this morning. That we are here not because of anything that we've done, but we are here solely because of what Jesus has done and what he's going to do in the end. Our faith is not based on what we do, but our faith is based on him. And so all the baggage that you've walked in with, all the stress that you've walked in with, I'm going to ask you this morning, let it go. And for the next hour, just get lost in his majesty. That's why we're here. For God's glory. By God's grace. Let me pray for you guys and we're going to worship some more. Father, you are good and you are holy and we don't deserve you. We don't deserve to be in your presence, God. But God, I'm thankful, I am thankful, God, that this morning we have that opportunity. God, I, I pray that you fill this space. I pray that you fill every home listening online. And God, in these moments, help us get lost in you. Help us get lost in your majesty. Help us get lost in your glory. Because Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. So, Father, I pray that you get all the glory, honor, and praise. I love you. I pray for every single person in this room. God, do a mighty work in their life this morning. Be with the worship team, God, as they lift up songs to you. Be with Brother Donnie as he opens the word. Because it's all about you. I love you. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. If I told you my story, you would hear hope, you wouldn't let go. If I told you my story, you would hear love, it never gave up. If I told my story you would hear lie but it wasn't mine if I should speak then let it be of the grace that is greater than all my sin of when justice was served and where mercy i
can stand against I choose to praise and glorify, glorify the name of all names Nothing can stand against Oh yes I will Let you hide in the lowest valley Yes I will bless your name We've seen what you can do, O oh God of wonders. Your power has no end. The things you've done before in greater measure, you will do again. Because there's no prison wall you can't break through, no. Mountain you can't move, all things are possible. There's no broken body you can't raise, no soul that you can't save, all things are possible. The darkest night you can light it up.
chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Come awaken your people. Come awaken the sin. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. Hear the chains hit the ground. God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. Holy, 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 Lord God. deserve your love, we don't deserve your grace or mercy, but you've lavished your love upon us. But we ask you to move in this place, do what only you can do. We need you. We're prone to sin. And we need your help. We're so thankful for the blood of Jesus that has paid the debt and we can know forgiveness. Lord, in Jesus' name, please move in this place. We pray this in your awesome, awesome name of Jesus. Good morning to all of you. If you would go ahead and take your copy of God's Word and turn to 1 John. Take your copy of God's Word, 1 John chapter 1. And we're going to be studying this morning verses 5 through 10. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. I'm not sure how many of you had to do chores when you were little. Raise your hand when you were growing up if you had to do chores. All right, some of you were spoiled. No, I'm just joking. So one of the chores that my brother and I had to do was to go and feed the dogs in the evenings. We hunted and did the hunting dog type thing. And so we had a bunch of dogs and the dog pen was probably about 100 yards or so, maybe 125 yards or so from our house when we stayed with my dad at my dad's house. And so my dad would send my brother and I out the front door 
with the dog, food, the scraps, and so forth. We would walk that long track in the dark to the dog pen. Here's one thing that my dad would do, though. Got an awesome dad, loved my dad. He's so radically cool and awesome in every form or fashion. But here's one thing my dad would do. So my dad would send my brother and I out the front door with the dog food in the pitch black dark, and my dad would go out the back door around the back of the house, and there was this gas tank, you know, the big round gas tanks. My dad would hide behind that petroleum tank, and you know what? My brother and I would walk right by the gas tank, holding that dog food, and guess what my dad would do? Cut on a flashlight so we could see better, right? My dad would jump out, and he would scare us to death, almost drop the dog food, and we would, we would just, Daddy, why are you doing it? And he would, he would take pleasure in that. Now, I, for the life of me, I cannot imagine a dad, and Rachel's laughing, I cannot imagine a dad taking pleasure in scaring his children. I just can't imagine that. So for years after that, my brother and I were a little skittish to walk in the dark, especially in the yard, simply because we didn't know what goon or buffoon would know, what person, what thing, what ghost, what, whatever we may think would jump out and get us. Maybe it's the fear of the unknown. That's why we're scared of the dark. Or maybe it's the fear of what you can't see. Regardless, this fear of darkness is this fear of the darkness dangers ahead because you can't see them well in the spiritual sense when it comes to your spiritual life my spiritual life it's very important for us to have this inner awareness of the dangers of walking in the dark and i would dare say that if we want to live a life that brings god the most glory and the most honor then we must have this spiritual awareness of the dangers of walking in this darkness. Now, the churches that John writes this letter to contain Christians who were apparently struggling with this idea, having this spiritual awareness of the dangers of walking in darkness. So John, he uses our passage today to help us understand the importance of walking, not in the darkness, but walking in the light. And that as we walk in the light, and as we understand who God is in walking in the light, as we walk in the light and understand what our sin is and what our sin does, then we ultimately get to this place of trusting fully in everything that Jesus has done for us so that we can walk in fellowship with God the way he wants us to. So let's look at this passage, verses 5 through 10, as we consider what it is we're talking about this morning. This is the message, he says, we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light. Say that phrase with me if you would please. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. Now, for you teachers in the Greek, that's a double negative. I know that it's bad, but in the Bible, it's used for emphasis. No darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. How many of you are grateful for that promise? Amen? Our worship team just sang every song talking about that promise and that hope. Then verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all, let's say that word, all unrighteousness. Two of you said that. Let's try that one more time. All unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, then we make him being God a liar and his word is not in us. And so here's what John wanted to do. Here's what he does. He wanted his readers to know God as light. And instead of lying about the sin in their lives, he wanted them to walk or to live in fellowship 
with him and with others by confessing their sins and trusting in the forgiveness of God. Now, doesn't that sound like a blueprint? Doesn't that sound like something we want to follow if we are a Christian? So hear me out. If you are a Christian, if you are someone who follows the Lord and you're doing everything you can to do that, but yet maybe sometimes you struggle to walk in the light consistently. Sometimes you struggle to consistently live in strong fellowship with the Lord. And you may be wondering if there's any help for you, then, then there is help right here. Or, or maybe you are a Christ follower and you've committed some sin or sins that you think God could never, ever forgive you for. You're thinking about it and the enemy has caused so much guilt and, and shame because of that sin in your life and you're thinking there is no way that God can forgive me for the sin that I have committed. And there is help and there is hope for you in this word that God has for us today. Because regardless of where we are, we can walk in the light. And in doing so, we can see how God works powerfully in and through our lives along the way. So how do we walk in the light? How does John help us to walk in the light? First of all, it begins by, I believe, walking in the truth about God. We have to walk in the truth about God. God, look again at verse 5. John says this, This is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. This is the message, he says, that we have heard. That's in the perfect tense of the Greek, and here's what that means. That means not only did they hear it then, but because of hearing it, it continued to change the way they lived their lives. It affected their life from that point forward. It's a completed action with ongoing results. And so he says, this is the message we have heard from him. They haven't gotten over it. It still changes their life to this day. And therefore, we proclaim this message to you. And here is the message, he says, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all when we think about all the ways that john could have chosen to describe god and his transcendence and his holiness and his justice and righteousness and his splendor and his glory. When we think about all the words that John could use to characterize God and his absolute perfection, we may think of a lot of other words besides what he uses, but here's what John says. God is light. God is light. Light. Now, when you look at your Bibles and you read through the narrative of the Scriptures, this analogy of light and darkness is used quite frequently in applying to our spiritual lives. The book of Psalms, if you read through the book of Psalms on a number of occasions, you will see God referred to as light. The prophets Isaiah and Micah in the Old Testament, they speak of of how there would be this, this future light that would come forth out of the darkness and the sorrow that the Israelites were living in. And then we get to the New Testament in the Gospel of John, this same author in his Gospel, he then personifies this light in a very powerful and applicable way. In John chapter 1, this very same John says this concerning Jesus Christ. In Jesus was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. He says, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. This is John the Baptist. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. And he says, John was not the light but came to bear witness about the light, the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. Jesus would then go on later in John's gospel. John records Jesus in chapter 8 and verse 12 of saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have what? The light 
of life. In John 12, verse 46, Jesus says, I have come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. So because God is light, and because those who come to him through Christ have the light of life, here's what we should do. Live our lives differently. Walk a different walk than those who walk in darkness. Instead, we turn away from the darkness and we live according to the truth that God in Christ gives us light that leads to spiritual life. And if you think about it, John's analogy then makes pretty good sense when he says that God is light. After all, what does light do? Light reveals itself. And we learned last Sunday morning that God revealed himself to us in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. What else does light do? Light dispels darkness. What is the first thing you do when you go in a very dark room if you don't want to hit your toe or your foot and maybe think something you shouldn't think or maybe shout something you shouldn't? What's the first thing you do? You turn the light on. Right? When the power goes out, you, you search for a flashlight. And if you're like me, you never find one that has batteries that work. And so you're really out of luck, or the boys have taken the Anyway, light dispels darkness, and it's God who shines into the darkness, we're told by John. To dispel that darkness, light illuminates and guides, doesn't it? And in the scriptures, we are told that God, through his Holy Spirit, dwells within believers to illuminate the truth, to guide us into all truth. You know what else light does? Have you ever held something up to the light? And man, you could hold it up to those lights there and it would reveal every... Have you ever held something up to light? Trying to see if there are any flaws. Light reveals flaws. He says God is light. And in his holiness and his perfection, he does everything that light does, but he does it in a way to give us this understanding of God that if we see God as light, then it changes the way we live our lives. And based on this proper understanding, the truth about God, we then take this next step. We avoid the lies about sin and self. So now, as John continues in this passage, he uses three if-then statements to warn us against, I think, three primary attitudes that people have towards sin and toward ourselves. And all three of these, they push back in some form or fashion against much of the false teaching that was prevalent in John's time, and certainly in our time as well. So here's the first way that we avoid the lies about sin and self. John says that we refuse to lie to others about our sin. We refuse to lie to others about our sin. I want you to notice the first claim that John references in verse number six. He says very simply, if we say we have fellowship with him, while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not Practice the truth. Now, if we say we have fellowship, we learned last Sunday morning that this word fellowship speaks more than just about gathering around a table to eat food. That's the Baptist way of thinking about fellowship. But biblical fellowship is more about intimacy. It's sharing in a common purpose. It is this idea of relationship. It's this idea of something deeper than the superficial. And so he, he clearly is saying if we say we have fellowship, intimacy, relationship with God while we walk, and that characterizes our lives, while we have this ongoing walk in darkness, he says we lie and we do not practice the truth. The Gnostics, those who were pushing the false teaching in John's time, they believed that those who were truly spiritual could not be defiled by sin. They believed that one's spirit could not be contaminated by the deeds of the flesh once they reached this place of spiritual gnosis. And so guess what? 
this is what people could then say if, if they make this claim. I can claim that I walk in fellowship with God and I can still walk in darkness or enjoy the works of darkness at the same time. For us today, or maybe when we're trying to make this practical for us today, John paints us the picture of a person who says to others, I know God, and I am a Christian. Hey, I got it, me and God, yet we are tight. I I live in fellowship with him. I live in relationship with him, but, but it doesn't matter how I live my life. He's talking about those who are failing to practice what they preach. Those who are good at talking the talk but fail to walk the absolutely. And he says very pointedly that we lie to others about our sin if we make this claim that we are walking in fellowship with God while we are actually walking in in darkness. It's this hands-off approach to religion, and it's a lie. We refuse to lie to others about our sin. We refuse to lie to ourselves about our sin. I want you to notice verse 8. He says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Now, notice, not that we don't practice the truth like he just shared in the verse we just looked at. But no, he says the truth isn't even in us. If we say we have no sin. Now these are again deeply convicting words. But again, they have merit in his day and I think ours as well. Because the Gnostics, the false believers of that day, also felt like when they attained that special spiritual knowledge or gnosis that their sin nature, meaning their inclination towards sin, was completely eradicated. They thought they were incapable of sinning. And so guess what? If you think you're incapable of sinning, then you don't take sin seriously. But not only do you not take sin seriously, it means that you have no problem with it because nothing you do could even be sin. And therefore, there's no need that you believe for the blood of Jesus Christ in your spiritual life. This view only encouraged people to enjoy the pleasures of sin, to to sin and to keep on Sinning, And John says that if we make the claim that we have no sin, then it's not that we're lying to others about our sin, but we're deceiving ourselves. We're fooling ourselves. And we are void of the spiritual truth that is rooted in Jesus Christ. Here we may think today of, of those who believe that everyone is morally good. That There are no such things as absolute good and absolute evil. That is just relative to what a person believes to be true about his or her own life. But John says, even though this may make their perception of heaven really, really wide and the path to heaven really, really big, it's a lie. And he says the truth is not in us. But he also says we should refuse to lie to ourselves and others about God. We refuse to lie to ourselves and others about God. Notice verse 10. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Now this claim here in verse 10, it reflects the obvious end of the previous two claims. For instance, if what we do cannot affect our spiritual being, If our nature cannot sin, if and as we reach this state of special spiritual enlightenment, then we have not sinned. Isn't that the only logical conclusion if we chart it out? But this is not simply a lie about our sin to other people. This is not simply a lie to ourselves about our sin. No, he says this is us lying about God. We make God a liar. We accuse him 
of lying. When you see that word sin, you should think of missing the mark. Missing the standard of God's perfect righteousness. And here's what God says. God says we've all sinned. From the pulpit to the pew. We have all sinned. The Bible teaches us that there's not one person that's really inherently good, that our nature itself is to sin. You don't have to teach babies how to be selfish. You don't have to teach babies and children how to be jealous. They come about that very naturally. You don't have to teach adults how to do those things either. Why? Because we all sin. Paul said it this way in Romans 3, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 5 and 12, he would go on to articulate how it is because of the sin of Adam that we, we've gotten the sin nature and therefore we sin and that, that sin has brought death. And he says it very, very convictingly in, in Romans 6 and verse 23 when he says that the wages of our sin is death. And here's what God did. Knowing that we all have this problem with sin, here's what God did. God so deeply hated sin, and God so deeply loved us, the sinner, that he lovingly sent his one and his only son, God in the flesh, to pay the penalty and the punishment for our sin with his own life. He so deeply loved us that through the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, he made a way for sinful man, that's us, to be reconciled, made right with a holy, perfect, and righteous God. But if we don't believe we sin, then we don't believe we have any need for any of that. And in believing so, John says, we prove that his word, the word of truth, the word of life, is not even in us. We cannot say that we do not sin and at the same time trust in and rely upon a God who sent his son to be our savior, can we? Not at all. And he says, we make him a liar and we do not have his word. But if we walk in the light, as we walk in the truth about God and the truth about our sin and ourselves, then we prove to be who we say we are and we prove to trust in what John notes next. We trust in the work of Christ and the faithfulness of our God. We trust in the work of Christ and the faithfulness of our God. Let's understand a couple of things John teaches about our forgiveness. Because again, it's clear, we've got a problem. Jesus came to solve that issue, to fix that problem. So let's talk about the forgiveness that John notes in this passage. He first notes that our forgiveness is rooted in the blood of Jesus Christ and its power. Our forgiveness is rooted in the power of the blood of Christ. And so we remember verse 6. When he says, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But, verse 7, if we walk in the light, the word walk, it means this characterizing of our life, this ongoing lifestyle and walk. Not that we may not sin from time to time, but yet this ongoing walk. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. From all sin. If we walk in the light, we enjoy this ongoing fellowship, this ongoing relationship, this ongoing intimacy as we walk in the light with God in Christ. But we also experience the ongoing power of the blood of Christ to cleanse us, or as the Greek would say, to keep on cleansing us from all sin that we commit in our life. But John has never acted like we ever attained a state of sinless perfection. He's not even insisted that at all. Instead, he's giving us the picture that we have this ongoing need of grace and mercy and forgiveness because of the problem we still have in this sin nature. And even though Jesus' death on the cross, even though his blood paid the penalty, 
and has brought forgiveness for every sin that we have ever committed, past, present, future, once and for all, there is still this ongoing, daily walk or relationship with God in Christ that requires our attention. No sin, hear me, no sin can ever affect our righteous standing before God as a believer, a follower of Jesus Christ. But it can, it does, and it will affect whether or not we are living a righteous life in the context of our relationship with him. David Guzik, he says it like this, the work of Jesus on the cross doesn't only deal with the guilt of sin that might send us to hell, It also deals with the stain of sin, which hinders our continual relationship with God. So we need to come to God often with this simple plea, cleanse me with the blood of Jesus. Not because we haven't been cleansed before, but because we need to be continually cleansed to enjoy continual intimacy and relationship with God. So maybe you're struggling in some way spiritually, because you're a Christian and, and you're doing your very best to walk in the light and to live in strong fellowship with him, but you've sinned. You've messed up. And the enemy is reminding you of that every single day of your life. And here's what John says to you. Trust in the power of the blood of Jesus Christ that has not only forgiven and cleansed you in Christ through the work of the cross, but that keeps on cleansing you even from that sin, whatever it may be. Our forgiveness is rooted in the power of the blood of Christ, but also our forgiveness is rooted in the faithfulness and the justice of God. Verse 9. How many of you heard this verse before? If you're like me, if you're a sinner like me, it's one of my favorite verses. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and he is just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He says, if we confess, when you hear the word confess, you may be thinking of going into this little room and confessing to this guy on the other side of the curtain or whatever it may be. That's not the biblical notion of confession. Confession carries the idea of agreeing with God about something he already knows to be true. Guys, kind of how we have to do with our spouses, with You know, men, with our wives, honey, you were right, I agree, I confess, yes, I agree with what you, she already knew she was right, so I just need to agree. You know, that is this idea with God, we agree with you about the sin in our lives. And it carries the the notion of being something that we do on a consistent basis, that confession is something that we practice It should characterize our spiritual lives as not a delayed response to sin, but as an immediate response to our sin. And if so, note what he says. If we confess, God is faithful. God is just to forgive us of that sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so here's how it works. When we sin, Instead of lying to ourselves about the sin, instead of lying to others about the sin and trying to accuse God of lying about the sin, we come broken before God and in humility and brokenness, we say, God, I admit or I confess my sin to you. It's not that he doesn't already know it, but we confess that to God And we ask for forgiveness, but we don't ask as if we are begging for something that is uncertain, but we ask as if we are certain for something that is certain. Why? Because God is faithful. Because God is just. And his faithfulness and justice is rooted in the work of Jesus Christ what he has accomplished for us. So you may be here this morning and you may be a Christian or maybe you're not a believer and you're just wondering how in the world could God ever forgive somebody like me? 
I don't know what you may have done in your life. I don't know where you've been in your life, where you've walked in your life, but God in heaven does. He knows everything about your life, and, and maybe you're just thinking, well, God, there's no way that you can forgive me. I'm a Christian. I'm supposed to be living through you, walking in fellowship with you. God, there's no way that you can forgive me for what I did. Nobody knows about it, God, but you and me, but there's no way you could ever forgive me. That is a lie, a lie from the pit of Hades. And you need to be reminded of who the liar really is. And it is not God, but it is our enemy. And you need to trust in the power of God's faithfulness in Christ to forgive you for whatever you have done in your life. Because hear this, friend. Your forgiveness, your forgiveness does not depend on your merit, nor does it depend on the magnitude of your sin, but your forgiveness depends on the faithfulness of God and the justice of God in Christ Jesus. And because of that, no matter what you have done, you can be forgiven. Because of that, no matter where you may find yourself, you can be forgiven. Not because you deserve it. None of us deserve it. But because he is faithful, and he is just. Amen? John pushes back against those who claim superiority over the sin in their lives through some type of special knowledge. John condemns those who act like their sin has no effect on them, and those who refuse to realize that they are sinners in need of a Savior sent from heaven to this earth to do what we could never do for ourselves. And these lies were threatening to pull the believers away from the gospel foundation that their faith had to be rooted in. And it all says to us that we can walk in truth about God. We can avoid the lies about sin and self, and we can trust in the work of Jesus Christ. We can trust in the faithfulness and the justice of God as we walk in the light. And my friends, we can experience the joy of walking in fellowship with our Savior. I remember the story that's told about a ship traveling through the pitch black night. As dark as dark could be on the sea, and the captain of the ship, he spotted a very, very bright light dead ahead on a collision course with his vessel. So he did what you would assume that this captain would do. He decided to, to send out this warning signal, and the warning simply read, change your course 10 degrees east. The light received this warning, and, and, and the, the captain there sent this signal back. No, you change your course 10 degrees west. So the captain then responded back, I am a captain in the United States Navy. Sir, you change your course. The light then responded back and said, look, I am a seaman, second class. You change your course, sir. Well, at this time, you have to imagine that the captain from the United States Navy, he is furious. And so he angrily then responds one more time, and he declares to the other person, he says, look, I am a battleship. I refuse to change my course. And the light on the other side sends this last signal. I am a lighthouse. It's up to you. A lighthouse standing guard to keep the ships in the darkness from sailing into the shore and refusing to change the course. My friends, there are times in our spiritual lives, many times, where God, who is light, shines forth through the darkness that we may find ourselves in. And he does so not to be the buzzkill that we often think he is, but to be the loving, compassionate, faithful, and just Father who is warning us about the dangers of the darkness and inviting us to find our refuge in him. And that is the joy of 
walking in the light. Would you please stand to your feet this morning? Heads bowed and eyes closed. As our altar workers come forward, I, and we allow the, the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, to, to have his way in these moments of invitation. Heads bowed and eyes closed. Maybe you are here. Maybe you are watching online. You'll watch later. And you are not a follower of Jesus Christ. That if someone would characterize your life right now, it would be that you are walking in darkness and not the light who is God in Christ. And you would honestly, you would openly admit, not to any person necessarily beside you, but before the God who created you and loves you and wants you to be in a right relationship with him, you would confess, you would admit to that God, I do not know you. I'm living in darkness, but I want to walk in the light light of Christ. If that's you, my friend, in your own way, in your own heart, from the very depths of your being, would you pray something like this? Dear God, today, I admit that I am a sinner walking in darkness and confessing my sin before you I admit that I believe Jesus died on the cross for that sin he was buried in the grave but rose to life and this day I will not ignore the warning. And I ask Jesus to be my Savior. I give my life to Him as Lord from this point forward. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Maybe you're here and you are a Christian and you're trying your best to walk and fellowship, relationship, and intimacy with God in Christ. And yet, maybe there's a sin that you've committed recently and the enemy's convinced you, oh, God won't forgive you for that. There's no way. And he's trying to keep that over you, to keep you from moving forward and, and growing and becoming all that God wants you to be. Maybe you'd come and talk to someone this morning or pray with someone or come to the altar and just rest and trust in the forgiveness accomplished by the power of the blood and the faithfulness of your God. Wherever you may find yourself at today, during this invitation, would you give heed to what the Spirit says? How sweet the sound the saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was Chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed you're thankful for God's amazing grace in Christ, would you say amen? Amen. He is faithful.
My friends, if, if you have made a decision today in person, online, we would love to know about that decision. Uh, let us know about that by texting the number that Pastor Drew shared at the beginning of the service. You can just text your name to 256-371-4610. Fill out that Connect card. There are some tangible physical Connect cards in the pew backs in front of you. You can also take one of those Connect cards. Let us know about the decision you made. You can come forward, let us know after service. If you're interested in membership, ministry, whatever your next step may be here at FBCG, we would love to hear about that. If you're new, worshiping with us for the first time, don't leave before we get to meet you. I'll, I'll even let you meet the best thing about me besides Jesus, and that is my wife and my boys. You'll even get to meet them, and that, that's worth waiting for. So, so if, you, if you would, just let us meet you, get to know you. I want to thank you for your faithful giving to our church. You guys are so awesome, not only with our recent Lottie Moon Christmas offering, but in so many ways that so we can keep reaching people for Jesus. Uh, you can give in a multitude of ways. You can give in person with envelopes or whatnot and put it in the offering boxes in the foyer back there. You can give online, fbcglencoe.com slash giving. You can text to give, just texting the word give to 256-242-5222 and do it in just a minute or two that way. But, but most of all, thank you. Thank you for giving. Before you leave, I wanted to remind you that next Sunday, we're going to have a special time of prayer for medical personnel. Uh, we are going to be throughout the course of this week asking you to bring uh, items that would bless and minister to those medical personnel who have been so faithful throughout the ongoing course of this pandemic to love and to care for people and meet the needs in people's lives. We've had that on Facebook. We've sent it out through our email blast. We also have some physical copies of paper. We're, we're starting to do a little bit more of that. We've got some of that back there with those lists on there as well. But if you'd bring those items throughout the week this week, we would appreciate that. Maybe you just feel like giving toward the cost. We can go purchase them. That's fine as well. And you can do that online. You can uh, do that in person today if you want to do that. But please remember that throughout the course of this week. A couple of folks in our church this week, they've kind of been the, on the receiving end of the blessing of these medical personnel. Uh, Barry and Cookie Baker, they're a big part of our faith family, serve in so many ways. Sister Cookie, earlier this week, had to go in the hospital. Just some pneumonia and some other challenges resulting from that. And she received some of the most amazing care that you could ever imagine. And, and their message to me was very simply, Brother Donnie, please, please do everything you can to encourage everybody that you can to be a part of this medical personnel recognition. They've been on the receipt. It got real to them this week. And they, are, they wanted me just to encourage you guys, and I'm more than happy to do that, to be a part of us loving on those individuals who are a blessing to so many others. If you want updates from our church and you're kind of missing out on some of those updates uh, and you've not signed up on our email blast, we don't have that information, just be sure to text the word update to that same connect number that we've shared with you often, 256-371-4610, a little short form. Fill that out. Let us know your email address. If you want the text updates, fill in your, your text number there and we will be able to get those to you. And uh, we're going to be introducing a new digital bulletin type platform pretty soon. Uh, we're going to have some half sheet bulletins available in the next few weeks. And we're, we're going to try to communicate um, as much as we possibly can. But we need you to help us by letting us know your contact information. So please do that before you leave today. Father God, thank you for your love. Thank you for your mercy, your kindness, for everything you've done for us in Jesus Christ. Now help us to go as your people, to live as your people, to do everything we can as those who've been saved, forgiven, and redeemed by the gospel to share the good news of the gospel with as many people as we can this week. Let us live the way we have been changed. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today.